And welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. Of course, data modeling is hard, but maybe. And this series is moderated by the esteemed Karen Lopez. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to a large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. Joining us today are two great panelists, Thomas LaRock, a.k.a. SQL Rockstar, and Jolene Job. Thomas is a seasoned IT professional with over a decade of technical and management experience. Currently serving as a technical evangelist for Confio Software, Thomas has progressed through several roles in his career, including programmer, analyst, and DBA. Thomas holds an MS degree in mathematics from Washington State University as a member of the Usability Professionals Association. Thomas currently serves on the board of directors for the Professional Association for SQL Server, PASS, and is a SQL Server MCM as well as MVP. Thomas can also be found blogging at thomaslarock.com and is the author of DB Survivor, Become a Rockstar DBA. Jim is the Senior Database Annualist at the Florida Department of Transportation Office of Information Services. She started out as a programmer, BASIC, Fortran, Pask Natural, COBOL, and several others, scripts to packages, loads and unloads. She's been a database administrator for uh, for several companies, and Jolene says she will model for food. And for food, and we're very excited as Jolene has been an attendee in many of our webinars and is the first attendee that we've invited to join our panel as we've just enjoyed her chat so much. And with that, I will turn the session over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Karen. How's the weather where you are? It's oh, in Portland. <laughs> it's Portland. So what else? <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon. And you're marvelous as always. And I want to thank Dave Percy for hosting this event. Um, you know, we couldn't do it without you. And I want to thank all the attendees. You know that, that I consider all of you all panelists as well. And in that, what I mean is, you're free. If you look to the WebEx screen, you are free to chat amongst each other. And we try to keep an eye on the great conversations that happen there. Uh, but if you have a question for the panel or a comment, um, you put that into the Q&A section down over up on the right-hand side near the bottom, and we will try to take those. But again, we try to match all that. And as Shannon said, I'm trying to monitor the stuff that's going on on Twitter, and to see that, you'll have to use the hashtag BCDmodeling. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of multitasking, but generally I can handle that. Um, and as a reminder, there are no slides for this. This isn't a presentation. This is a discussion. So that means that um, that we need to do is uh, listically pay attention to chats, and you don't have to look at a bunch of PowerPoint bullets. So consider this a plus. So before we get started, though, because we've introduced ourselves, now I want to know who you guys are, and that means I'm going to go ahead and open up a poll so you should see and be able to vote. If you don't know who you are or you're sure, remember to vote on what you really know, not what your job title is, and not necessarily even what your current project role is, but uh, who you think you are. And oh, when your boss says that, it sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> and Let's see. Yeah, people are still voting along. You got about 20 more seconds to figure out what your job is and what the heck it is you do around here. And I'm going to go ahead. Now you have 20 seconds. Well, maybe. Let's see. WebEx is being to me with two different numbers. There's a the issue there. So, like, almost all of you got a chance. To tell us who you are, and I'm just going to show that in a second. Actually, you can see now what we have is about a lot of data modelers and architects. That makes sense. Almost half of you, some of you are business. 13% of you are business analysts or other analysts. About a little 10% are DBAs, devs, or other 
technical people, 6% are architects, 6% of you are just others, and 18% of you have no clue. <laughs> so the next question is how long have you been actively data modeling? And by data modeling, I mean creating or maintaining data models or let's just say heavily involved in the processes that result in the production of a data model. I keep saying we have music for when these are going. A little countdown thing. Care people that used to do demodeling but no longer do demodeling just give how long they yeah, that's, good. Okay. that's a good that's a good answer. That's a good approach. And take off your shoes to figure out how long you've been doing it. Maybe you're in the ones that said I stopped counting. I wonder on my desk for that. <laughs> for counting years? Yes. I actually myself stopped counting at 20. So, okay, so let's see. I can share with you the results. What we have, yeah, so about 27% of you, about a quarter of you, zero to two years, a little under 10%, three to five years, a little 10% for six to 10, 2% uh, of you, 11 to 15, and 14% I stopped counting, which I'm just going to pretend is the nice way of saying very experienced, not old people. And 20% uh, of you aren't sure or maybe had Interesting. Not. That's an interesting distribution. What? It's just, if you think about it, at first you look at it, oh, well, three or five years ago, maybe people weren't in data modeling. But now I'm thinking people with five years experience, it's almost like a teenager. They figure, eh, I already know it all. But I need to attend a webinar to learn more. <laughs> it could be. That's a good, good point about that. Um, yeah, interesting. We should. I know we've asked these two questions for a few webinars now, so it'd be interesting. Maybe I should uh, try to go back through and figure out. You know, just keep collecting the data to see if maybe there's a, a correlation between years of experience and the topic, or see if there's any trends. That would be interesting. Good point. So, do any of those uh, results surprise you? Um, I, yeah, the, the 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 zoo years. I'm I'm with Thomas. Uh, what happened yeah. a couple of years ago that suddenly sparked an interest in this when it apparently ah. had been flagging over time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that um, in the uh, chat. And, um, I want, so I declared the year of 2012 the year of data. As we started hearing about big data, data breaches, data security, um, the advent of new database technologies, and under if that also means there's been an uptick uh, of people needing to be doing data modeling. Or, which is surprising too, because it seems like the the focus has been more on programmers than has been on, on and feeding of the data that, that makes the program work. Uh, so I, and we've talked about that on some of the other webinars. And that uh, I think, though, that the pendulum is swinging back because of this, you know, the advent of more focus on data. And it doesn't mean, I mean, it is lesser of a focus on software. I just think we got software heavy. And I think the pendulum is coming back. And I think one of the reasons that is is that we kind of messed up our data. Um, and also been some high-profile data issues, you know, whether it's healthcare.gov, and we have, you know, the President of the United States talking about data issues and, and those sort of things. That doesn't always, you know, you know, advent of, of lots of services moving to online has caused more demand for people to try to sort out the data. See research on, on this. So interesting. So thank you all for the polls. We another one coming up later, but now I just want to sort of skip on to some of the things. So today's topic was about, um, you know, of course the modeling's hard, but maybe, maybe we are making it too hard. So 
I want us to talk about how modelers and architects and people who participate in the data modeling and architecture process are using tools and skills and experiences and other resources to meet business requirements and are doing it in the most effective and efficient way. So, uh, uh, and I'll invite you to put your questions in into the Q&A as well as into the chat. But I started with a premise that, of course, data modeling is hard. But my question is to start out with: is is data modeling actually difficult? Um, what do you think, Jolene? I I don't I don't think it's especially difficult. I think the difficulty is in figuring out what you have actually model and how to put all those pieces together. At least that that's my experience in, in starting out as a dental data modeler, I guess, mm -hmm. is that yeah. you have to get all the pieces, and it's so difficult to, to drag all the pieces out of people who have them in their heads. I agree with that. Like So, um, you know, one of the sort of mantras that people talk about is it's not the data models, it's the data modeling that's hard. Uh, and I think that's true for a lot of requirement solicitation, like being able to um, get businesses to um, participate and decide what their data priorities are, or what the rules around data should be, um, and getting that type of support. And to a degree, I think that businesses, um, you know, again, the pendulum thing, have wanted data to be fast. Uh, and have focused a lot on getting the right data faster. I think there's always been an assumption that we're always going to get the right data. Um, Tom, oh, you're that's, a DBA. That's very yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. So, Tom, you're a DBA. You want performance, and who cares how good the data is, right? Exactly. <laughs> but uh, at the end, what I want is for my phone to not ring. So that's really uh, – <laughs> I want to be left alone to sleep at night. That's what I want as a DBA. Okay. So is your question still – do you think data modeling is difficult? Yes. Yeah. So the academic idea of doing a data model, I believe is difficult, right? I can pick up a book. I can have an understanding of how to build an actual model, relational – or, or whatnot. That actually isn't difficult. It requires their skill, right? It, it requires uh, lots of practice to get very good at it. What the difficult part is, is that the academic world, which has no real relation to the real world, and the real world is this mess. And you see people, they build a system, and they put this model into practice, and then you find, I don't know, a bank is going to send you a file with data in a particular format, so you're just going to accept that. And we end up with this, our buckets. People say, hey, I'd really like this to be, I don't know, VAR 100, but now it's got to be VAR char max, because these other down, upstream and downstream people don't want to play with nice with me. That's where the real difficult parts come more often than not. Yeah, good point. Um, I think that is one of the things, and one of my sort of follow-up questions for this is, you know, I see a lot of, like you said, books and one-day courses on how to teach someone to be a data modeler. Um, how do you feel about, about those? I think Tom's right. You can learn the academics of it in a very short period of time, one or two days, and most of that is learning how to use a specific tool to do it. Mm -hmm. Take Irwin. One day, you can figure out or you can be taught the the function of Erwin and actually use it. But turn that into practice. Be able to listen to a user and say, oh, this, this is what you're talking about. Again, it's all the pieces of the puzzle. You're, you're, you're stuck trying to, to um, <laughs> I guess, you're stuck trying to tame their brain waves. And, and that's, maybe I answered incorrectly, the data no. model is fairly easy. Maybe the data modeling in the getting the information you need yeah. is tough. I think yeah. Thomas, being oh, a, Thomas being a DBA, um, we work very closely in, in our group. The, the DBAs and the DBAs work extremely closely so that we don't have those performance issues. 
Yeah, that's a, a big thing. I, I had um, I have a blog post camp on data diversity about the separation. You know, where's the line between DAs and DBAs? Um, but I think that that really helps. And in a lot of cases, in a lot of jobs, though, the data architects, the data modelers, are completely separate from the builders, implementers. They build logical models, and they never really directly see the results of their modeling, and they throw those over the wall to the technical teams, and the technical teams say, what the hell is this? Someone needs to build a database. Let's go build a database. And while the data modelers have gone off to another project, and I've, I've had a very dysfunctional process, and I think that's one thing that makes data modeling hard is – not having that sort of end-to-end -end process, what I call model-driven development for those things. Uh, the other thing is, is that I think that most of the courses and books that that I've seen, they teach data modeling notation, which is something you know, need to know, and they teach data modeling tools, but they don't go a lot into, and they teach normalization. So those, that's sort of the triangle of teaching data modeling, but they have a lot of extensive lab or hands-on experience or showing people the complete year you go from conceptual to logical to physical and you go put data in something and write queries about it. Like I think that's really rare. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I can't. We do have a unique team. I, yeah. We understand this. Um, but wondering... In this to ourselves. I'm wondering okay. if if our our separateness is self inflicted. I think times is like a lot of times when I come on a project, the first thing I try to repair is the fact that um, it's so separated and there's a lot of resistance to that, especially given that um, usually data modelers have quite a bit of IT experience which means they have a type of seniority. And uh, maybe where, you know, the bullpens where we keep our developers and throw pieces at them, um, you know, that's not a place where the DAs like to hang out or want to have a desk or a pod. And I've seen a lot of resistance that way. So it's kind of the culture of data architecture versus all those, those things. Well, programmers, programmers are by nature blinded, have blinders on, and that's good. That are there for that. What that's what makes them good. They see the here and the right now. But data modelers and DBAs, our responsibility is at a higher level. We the enterprise. We can't just focus on what we have on our desk in front of us right now. We understand that's what you need, but we have to make it fit into the larger picture. Mm -hmm. I, that's a great point, and actually a good segue into some of the. Uh, uh, one of the topics I wanted to talk about, which is people. Uh, one of the, uh, Terry Weinberg is a great writer on all kinds of systems and technical and effectiveness things. He says that every problem, every technical problem is actually a people problem. There are technical problems. And that's kind of a radical thing, but I get where he's coming from, um, where he talks about people having different points of view styles is is sometimes the dysfunctional part. And I know, Tom, you've blogged a lot about um, different points of view and effectiveness of people and collaboration. Um, what do you think about, about sort of working, trying to work with people that makes our job so, so hard? I've written one voice on the subject. Uh, there's always, well, it's just in general. I, I don't think that's a big surprise between two people is a difficult thing or what. Uh, I also think that, uh, you know, you have these motivating factors. What drives the business, right, not be what drives, say, a DBA. So as a DBA, my focus will be on recovery. If I can't recover your data, I might as well just leave town, right? I, that's my number one thing I've got to do. Everything really is secondary. Mm -hmm. That might be at odds with what business wants, not what they need, but what they want, and I think when, when I heard Jolene talk about, hey, maybe we've done this to this ourselves, I, we kind of have because a lot of people naturally don't want somebody in the room who aren't really aligned with theirs. So if I'm sitting there reminding you about disasters, 
how it's not, you know, my goal is kind of a way of what you really want, then end up just deciding to have two separate meetings, right? Why have, this, why have the people yeah. in the same room? And it's a difficult thing for people to get around and say, you know, the person I need in the room most is the person most likely to disagree with me. So I understand what their point of view is. If, if we come to an agreement, then what up with, you know, should be good for just about everybody else. So the contrarian point of view is often the one you want to seek out first, but it's naturally the one that people tend to avoid. Yeah, and he likes to be told no. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen that also. It's a good point, Tom, where so business users and they they really hate watching IT folks argue with each other. Right? And when IT people in a team start arguing with each other about the validity of a surrogate key or whether something should be in Varchar or Varchar or whether we should be using SQL or DB2 or Hadoop. The business users don't really have a lot of contribution to that. They feel like it's a big waste of time. And so they start meeting with the technical people separately so they can use their time effectively. But of course, then they're giving IT completely conflicting priorities. So the DBAs and devs, yes, we need sub-second response time to go this massive query. And they tell the DA people, and the answers better dang well be right 100% of the time. And I need to have my data. I have... You know, real-time data doing this, and they tell network people, yeah, we want the data to be secure, but we want to be able to log in without having to worry about a password because passwords are a pain in the butt. And then they send everyone off to try to go do their work, and yet those are kind of conflicting. They're not so much conflicting as they all involve trade-offs, and it's hard to do those trade-offs separately. Yeah. So... That brings to the thing that makes it hard is that we get connecting reward systems for management. So, okay, so when you work for a, um, a government organization, are there, um, what was your performance rated relative to data that might be different than a developer or DBA is? Um, my, my criteria is nearly solely subjective. Yeah, based mostly on um, how I play with others than the, the work <laughs> product. Uh, that is an important thing, right? Of of course, yes. But you know, the the work product and whether or not the database actually works. Can you get data in? Can you get data out? And like Tom says, yeah. can you can you actually save it when you gotta? Uh, yeah. That part that part of my job is is really not even and part of the criteria. And there really is no incentive and there is no bonus. And <laughs> we we do some peer reviews, but mostly that's around a table when we're talking <laughs> to each other. Um, that's true. And, and I mean, have, <clears throat> well, I mean, incentive plans for data architects that measured things like um, uh, data quality or data integrity as well as integration and reuse, you know, that but sometimes uh you know, a developer saying, Well if we have to do that it'll slow the system down or if we have to do that it's gonna take us six more months instead of the two weeks that I said it was gonna to take to do something. And so I don't know how uh, how a business user would be able to sort out all, all those things which is maybe they uh you know, flat to just are you a good team player? But the business users users don't, don't rate me. Well, yeah, not directly. No. <laughs> in your maybe not, not in your organization. So in in organizations I've worked at, the business users do, who are on the projects do participate in those types of peer reviews. When worked for revenue, reviews. for revenue we had a three hundred and sixty evaluation. And it's yes. an eye opener in so many different ways. Um, the past executive introduced it, and um, yes, that was a very interesting thing, and I really appreciated it. Mm -hmm. But where I work now, not, not so much. And, yeah. and I think if if it were we to the people thing again, it, yeah. it's 
technology, but it's the people thing. We speak entirely different languages. Business and programmers, DAs, and DBATs, we speak entirely different languages, and sometimes we need we need in the room. We need an interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point, and and I think that's another thing that's our own downfalls. Like I'm, I'm holding us all accountable for that. Um, make the business users get an out because they get to speak their language. But I do find that um, you know, things in the IT business is relatively new profession, and we are getting very experienced. And I think that. We love products and vendors drive our terminology much more than other professions do, you know. And it makes it very, very difficult to have a productive conversation with other uh, other people on our teams. I find even like, but entity means something completely different in the entity framework in the Microsoft world than it does in the data modeling world than it does in anything else. Right. And we have to we have to manage to. I managed to struggle all of those because actually modeling is a combination of a bunch of things. It's not just one. We're not just looking at yeah. code and, and trying to make it work. It's it's you know being part referee and part business analyst and part log- mm-hmm. logician and so many other things all at once that we can sell ourselves especially well. Nobody really yeah. knows we're doing any of this. A really great point. So IT in general, I think, does a lousy job at marketing value to the business. I think data architects and modelers are even worse at it. Um, I talked in one of my talks about how, um, you know, a, a diver, uh, sort of a certain attitude, um, no problems talking to business users about all the successes they had over the last week. In fact, even sort of the Agile Scrum stand-up meeting is kind of about that. It's it's not a bragging thing, but it is saying, I got this accomplished, and I'm going to do this tomorrow, and I'm going to get it accomplished. And yet, our sort of traditional waterfall method approach that data architects love, you know, just assumes that we're all doing a great job. We only, you know, recognize outstanding accomplishments instead of the regular ones. We only talk about those. Do you see that cultural difference? Okay. Sometimes, but not very often. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. sometimes you do get um, you do get business a person who are all is said and done, and their application is out there and being used, and thing is loved. We'll come back to you and say we could not have done this without you because you were such a nitpicky little twit. That <laughs> you, you actually kept us from shooting ourselves in the foot on a number of occasions, and you were real pain while you were doing it. But oh, yeah. we we couldn't have done it without you. I certainly have had that happen a bunch of times. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's that's really great. I know when an end user talks to me about those things, I'm like, oh, please go talk to a hundred more people. <laughs> So, Tom, um, talking about people differences, and I know you've also um, talked about um, people and hiring practices and things like that. So how, what do you think about, about hiring people for their skills versus their team fit versus um, their tool skills versus their detailed knowledge of a product? What is there that makes would make something like data modeling more difficult than it needs to be. My experience uh, shows me that more often than not, right, uh, a a skill like data modeling really treated like a, a real valued resource. Okay, so in words, uh, if you need an architect, you think, okay, I need an architect. That's somebody who can do data modeling. If people ever say to themselves, you know what, uh, I need to go find a data modeler for this. They just don't have a concept of that. What they have a concept is, I need somebody that can write a code or I need somebody that can administer a database or a server. Those are the knowns that people's tiny brains can conceive, right? So, oh, I understand what that is. But modeling is such an abstraction. It's like, I need to go hire a professor. And I don't think of it that way. So what they end up doing is, there's somebody 
to roll, like a coder or something like that, and they say, oh, it looks like I think we're somebody to go build this database. Can't you handle that? You do coding. And these people end up kind of falling backwards into data modeling, same way that most of us fall backwards into being a database administrator. So they're really getting hired as a modeler. Like, would there be uh, under 10 questions in an interview for a data modeler? Probably not. Maybe for an architect, maybe for a project manager. But they're saying, hey, look, you know what I need? I need somebody expert in Erwin and nothing else. I see that. I just think data modeling is one of these things that's just kind of expected that people have these skills. Under that, the makers themselves, how awful they are with some of the defaults they give us. So people sit in front of these tools, they create these models, and they think it's got to be good enough, and that's what ends up getting deployed ultimately. That's a good point. Um, and I think that's probably been more true, is that um, a lot of referrals I get for work have to do with someone's got a data problem, and they know as a data person, but they're not even sure that um, that they have a data model or don't even understand what the value is, or they've heard a lot of mis myths and misunderstandings about them, like that they have to take a year to do or, or something like that. So that's a really good point. Um, that's not the data modeler. Architect and and in our group we're both the DA are both. Yeah, um, I tend to use those terms interchangeably. By the way, even though I know a lot of organizations accept um, those duties. If you need to know where some data is, if you need to know where specific pieces of data are, you don't go to the DBA. Over to our side of the hall, and and you find one of us and say, Hey, I need to find something that does this or says this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that, too, we don't do a good job in bringing up during evaluation time. You know how many people, how much time we saved? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have to go look for this. We knew where it was. Yeah. Where it was. We gave them every piece of information they could ever want about this piece of this stuff. Because the work that came before. Absolutely. That wasn't wasn't just data modeling, it was finding stuff out and writing it down in a in a consistent manner in a place Correct. to get to it. And, seems, that's, I think, and, and Thomas is right, that, that seems to be a, well, of course you're going to do that. Well, no, <laughs> not of course. <laughs> no, because they're going to stick it in a spreadsheet on their project drive, right? Correct. That's exactly. <laughs> or keep it in their head. Yeah. Excellent, excellent discussions. Sort of, the, we've talked a little bit about tools and training a little bit. Um, so you were, you have a background of programmer and DBA and some technical stuff, and then data modeler. How do you make that transition there? I have puzzles. I do puzzles every day, and programming is a puzzle. Mm -hmm. and when I was trying to figure out, I moved to a new job and was given an assignment. I realized I didn't know where anything was, and I didn't know what the database looked like. So how could I possibly get data out of it? Uh, with a data dictionary, and, and then started to draw. Oh, this is how this fits together. When my boss at that time saw that, he said, "Oh, well, you here and document this one too." Mm -hmm. So that's uh, total accidental data modeler. <laughs> and after after the fact. Did you go on training? Did you read books? Did you um, read books? Went to some uh, DEMA <laughs> DEMA conferences. Yeah. Um, yeah. Read a lot of stuff online. Yep. You, you can learn real fast the nomenclature. Yeah. Easy. And I think Easy. the vast majority of data modelers came through that what I call the apprentice thing. You know, that's traditionally how we've done skill transfer very traditionally in the traditional world. It's someone just discovers that they have an interest in it you alongside more skilled people, but now we have the internet to teach us right and wrong, right? Right. <laughs> well, not so, so much right and wrong, but... Um, <laughs> no, they can yeah, teach you, us yeah. well or poorly. <laughs> you you yeah. can do this, but it's going to hurt you. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I thought from DBAs a lot. Yeah, So, but that's kind of one of the things that I think makes data modeling hard for people, or, and one of the questions we have in the QA is how someone makes this 
a segue from programming or other technical skills to data modeling. And there's, I mean, there's a classic career, it's not really a career move, a career transition, going from one IT role to another, and lots of people do that. And you know, I always think it's a lot of self-study, it's full training, it's being able to work alongside people who know what they're doing. To me, that's always my number one recommended way of doing it. But that's hard to do if you work in a company that doesn't have data modelers, data architects, or doesn't have it as a formal role. And if they leave it up to other people. Um, and I think that is uh, the things that we do as a profession that makes it hard is there's not a lot of training out there. Uh, I know of people, I do it, I know of a lot of great, great people who do it, but I'm just saying you, you can't, you know, go to your lo local um you can't just go training in town someplace usually. Usually it involves travel or bringing someone in to do all that. Uh, and um, I think that being able to have someone review your models and point out, you know, well, you probably should have considered this or you might consider doing this another way or that flat out isn't even implementable. That's always a favorite one of mine. So you know, modeling is hard, but we make it harder by not recognizing it that takes hands-on experience and training to learn. What you thought, Tom? Absolutely. Uh, uh, awareness, if there's, there's just seems to be a lack of awareness, and I think we're moving further and further away from it as things get easier and easier to implement out of the box. Things, I think they had a post a while back, right, data modeling is dead along with data modeling. Uh, you've gone through this trend in the industry where you you needed to have this architect, you knew you needed to have data professionals come in and help uh, build something, and they designed a logical model and I talked to the DBs who had to help implement the physical model. You knew you needed all that if you were some type of shop, right? Uh, nowadays, you get smaller shops, two people come together, they have an idea, they grab software off the shelf, they're off their run. It's a popular thing. Uh, Late down the road, somebody comes back, they look at it, and they go, whoa, who built this thing? If they didn't build the scale, that's for sure. And then with the cloud, we even have further abstraction. Right? But now with the cloud, what you're finding is I there, there's an idea that a little more focus now on the fact that you want to get it right from the start because now there's going to be a performance and a cost penalty for you. You don't design it right from the beginning. So, so I think it's coming back into a vogue, right, maybe into fashion these days, but, but you have the awareness. If you don't have the awareness, the people don't put a value on it and they just don't care about it. And that's difficult to get things done. Actually, that's a great point about, so we've gone through this phase of, um, you know, storage is free. We went from it being very expensive and we worried about, you know, tiny little data type links for making sure that our records were no and that we didn't collect too many. And then we kind of went to where it's practically free, and now we're going to cloud resources. And in the cloud, you pay for every one and zero, every bit and byte that you're sending up there or, or that you're taking out and that's sitting up there. And I, I'm starting to see more requests for sort of sizing data appropriately, not undersizing it, but sizing it appropriately. And that generally takes some data architecture skills. You have to know the nature of the data. You have to know uh, what makes for a good clean length for it and what data type it is. So you understand that cost. Is that the thing you're talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's an excellent point. Everything old is new again. Yes. <laughs> it is. I think difference that I say about the cloud is, you know, when I had that before in the mainframe world, the difference is now anyone right. can go put some data, a couple gigabytes of data up into the cloud just with their corporate credit card, not realizing what, you know, the, the, the rates look real small and affordable until you put a whole bunch of data out there and keep bringing it back and forth across the wire. It can get large really fast. Um, that brings up, you know, people worry about the security of, data cloud, and I worry more about people, not so much what architected solution is using secure cloud, but just any old user or IT person in the cloud that has no business going outside the company. I mean, those kind of things scare me as well. 
and that's why part of my role as a data architect is to assess sort of security, the sensitivity, the GII, the health data, you know, to say, hey, this piece of data can't go up into the cloud because it's protected, right? Yes, we have some of the same discussions here. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the, the services that DA provides is maintaining all of the designations for every piece of data that we can get our little, little hands on. Every yeah, I found about. it really interesting. So some of the things that I had never thought of that was health data actually could be considered. So things like what your meal preference is on flight right. um, could, uh, you know, is something that you know most people just think of. Oh, okay, yeah. But it's actually protected data, so you have to worry about even something as what you know as simple as that. And you know, I can put in the data model say hey, this is covered under sensitive health data, and now we need to protect it appropriately. So that's interesting. Um, but you know that because in my in my experience, programmers don't think about those things. Get that from the business users, right? right? Absolutely. And I agree with the programmers about why that's crazy, <laughs> because I'm the one that takes that and says, okay, programmers, like so for instance, in the case, this data has to be encrypted. No one likes encrypting data that they think doesn't need to be encrypted because that's a performance hit. It also has all these other trade-offs with programming it. You know, it has to be encrypted and decrypted. It has to be protected in all kinds of other ways. The backups get extra protection. There's all kinds of a ripple effect for that. Uh, but it's not health data. Well, it doesn't really matter what you think. <laughs> it is. So, um, you, I, I find that part fascinating. When you have those conversations, do do you have the 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 bit owners, the data owners? backing you up on that? Yes. Okay. Um, mostly because so much of this stuff, um, you know, has some – one of the reasons why I think we're in the years of data is that there's some pretty embarrassing consequences to it. Well, there are fines and things. Uh, now that data breaches are being reported so widely, um, you know, a lot of business users don't want to be showing up on the front page of the New York Times that they disclosed health data. It doesn't matter that eventually it gets reported that it was these low-fat meal choice or or something like that, even though that's still a violation of their privacy. Um, that's all that anyone will know about their solution, right, or about their data, was that it, their health data was exposed, right? And so it uh, depends on how much uh, authority I have as an architect on the project to be able to say, no, it's sensitive data, we must treat it this way. Then they can go to the business users and get it, it ruled that it doesn't need to be protected. And they do that a couple times and they realize what is what waste of time that might be. <laughs> so. Um, so we talked about hiring practices and people and making it harder. Uh, we talked about apprenticing and learning and education. And Jolene, you talked about you went to some DEMA meetings and everything. One of the things that I find has made data modeling easier for me over the years, and it's paid off big times, is this, this, this of community in the data profession and going to things like my local DEMA meetings, the data conference, to conferences like PASS, like other things, um, being of a community of people outside your own organizations, how did that help make data modeling easier? It's the old story of you are not alone, child. <laughs> there, there, there are others suffering the same trials and travails. Yeah. We can help you. Yeah. Or here's how you can help yourself. That's the way to uh, it. Here's how to help yourself. That's a good point. And Tom, what about you? I think this sums it up. Um, it's certainly, you know, the addition that I'm on the board of directors for PASS that you mentioned, uh, which is connect, share, and learn, right? That's thing we do. We're very focused on connect, share, and learn. And I found that out years ago that uh, a lot of value in understanding I'm not alone. A lot of DBAs, especially a SQL Server DBA, you find you're the only one in the shop because 
it should be easy to deploy and implement uh, an instance of SQL Server. Anybody mobile can click next, 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 and, and have a database. So yeah. they, you, you have troubles. You have troubles with that. You have trouble communicating with business users, and that. you have troubles, but you feel alone. And he said, uh, once you know that you're alone, that that kind of changes things a little bit. Mm. No, I, I, knowing that I, I can email you or I can email Shannon and say, I need help, where can I go? That is yeah. huge burn off my shoulders. Yeah, I think too. And I think um, building that network of people, I mean, certainly over the years I've reached out to all kinds of people asking, you know, I've got this kind of weird situation. And, you know, it, sometimes it's a specific data modeling problem, which is, you know, I, I run these um, these online forums for data model related stuff, although that communication mechanism is really dying off as the discussions have moved mostly to social media or to vendor specific forums. Um, I think, you know, the thing was is it was helping each other, sometimes doing and arguing, but helping each other understand how to do a better job and sharing that with each other. And one of the things that I'm kind of saddened by is that. Um, because the discussions have now spread everywhere, it's a lot harder to find an answer and to get a group of people to say, well, you need to think about this, and then someone else jumping in saying, oh, no, but you need to consider this, and don't forget that your tool also does that. Um, I think that's made our job harder, is that now in order to get help with a complex cross-platform management problem, is we either have to go to an in-person meeting again, a conference, which is a wonderful way of doing that. I just can't do that every day. Or to three different boards, discussion lists, and Twitter, and try to get help with it. It's kind of making our job harder. Uh, I think uh, one of the other things is, is that what we used to do on all these forums is we'd share scripts, like macros, or scripts that were used to make it easier and faster to use our tools. And I think that's sort of, sort of off. I mean, one of my things is a, a, a data modeler is the best data modeler, not lazy and then they don't do work, but lazy as in we want to spend our time doing the real valuable work and let the computers do the parts that are um, easy for them to do. And we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A about the role of tools, um, uh, about it's not about the tools, it's about the modeling. And I definitely agree with that. But in response to that, I think that like, the stuff that I model is so complex. I mean, a typical model I might work on has tens of thousands of pieces of information on it. I can do that in a spreadsheet. I can't do that in Visio. I, I need a real enterprise-grade modeling tool to make that work. Um, Joe, you you mentioned a, a tool you guys are using Irwin, or you have used Irwin, or something like that. Um, we're we're on Irwin nine two, fixing to go to nine okay. five. We um, also have a legacy system, Gen. Anybody know yeah. Gen? <laughs> the case. <laughs> um, our our um, all of our financial information was coded through Gen. Is that Gen or something like that? I think they call it Vantage Gen now. Okay, I don't know. Um, but the reason I bring that up is, is that I'm wondering if, um, do you think you could do data modeling with just a drawing tool? Not anymore, no. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, too com so, it's too complex and it's too integrated. You, you really appreciate both Gen and it's a CA. I mean, the Gen is a CA product as well. I yeah. appreciate that both of them allow you to have. You can see everything you need to see and all the little octopus arms that are coming <laughs> in and going out. That's amazing. You can't do drawing. Yeah, and, and I think that that's also one of the things that people start out doing data modeling, but their boss doesn't want to pay. And, yeah, and and they use a drawing tool, and they realize it just gets harder and harder and harder to do the work as you put more stuff in it. And it's not about modeling; it's about drawing a model one time through. It do, it does a wonderful job of that, by the way. Yeah. Right. right? A model, but that yep. 
like 1% of the work we need to do. So I find it interesting that one of the ways we make data modeling hard is by using the wrong tools, and it's kind of a catch-22 for organizations that want to start data modeling because they end up not delivering value that they want to deliver from it because they're using the wrong tools. So I, I think that's a, a one as well. And one of the things that Tom brought up earlier about sort of the role of modeling is the fact that so in the decades ago when I started, we built data models and we designed databases from scratch. And right, right. now that's such a tiny part of what I do anymore. The models I do are models around package solutions or integration models of the solution, you know, getting data from one package into another, from a spreadsheet into XML. You know, it really is about modeling data as it sits in many different physical platforms. And I think that people associate data modeling with just Greenfield build a brand new database. And is, do you guys a lot of creating databases from scratch? Uh, yes. And we uh, do. We do, but but as I said, now our databases are yes, we build them from scratch, but everything is so integrated that you you have basically <laughs> you have your base information already there. All you're doing is adding yeah. a piece or two to it. Ah, uh, okay. So you've, you've built upon it. That also is is more common in government or government organizations, just because there aren't nearly as many the shelf packages as there are uh, maybe for other industries as well. Um, but you do you models for canonical models, like for sharing information between systems? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And that's where the value of data modeling still de de delivers. Um, we've also a question in the Q&A. Do you think big data tools and data warehouse appliances are devoing modeling and architecture? Um, um, well, you know, with no SQL databases, you don't really need a schema, do you? <laughs> right. But so, then you still need to know the data, though, right? Of, of what, course. That's that what I think turns you less into less a data modeler and more of a, a data steward or um, a yeah. master data manager, even a data manager. Yeah, that's important, too. It's, uh, and that's why I tend to use the term data architect. Because I think all of the, that's the word I use to describe. I just help people figure out their data and know when it's good data and know when it's acceptable quality and that there is levels of quality and help get data moved around properly. Integrated is the big one for us. And move, yes. We move it around a lot, but we do the, the integration, the, the BI and the, the dashboard. We, Excellent. That's a lot of fun. Um, so I should go through. Oh, I'm going to questions while I also open our poll. And this is what organization you get to pick one. Your organization's biggest obstacle, roadblock for data modeling success. The page off to do your email. You can jump back over to the WebEx and can you, add, you should add in. in should add in though all of the above. Uh, I was going to make it multiple choice, but I figured people would pick all of them. So I think awareness or knowledge. I'll say skills. Then. We've been working really, really hard to create and maintain an enterprise data model. Mm -hmm. and we have seeing successes at different times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but part of what part of what stymies us is the fact that we have lots of folks out in the districts doing their own IT thing and building their own databases. So we may see it. We may have it documented as sensitive, but we have no idea what they're doing with it out there. Yeah, that's the scary part, right? The whole end to end of the life cycle of knowing what's happening and everything. They I don't think, want us to know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Yeah, and th that is the hard part. And I keep pushing in an effective data program, whatever you want to call it, data governance, stewardship, whatever, is that architects need to know more about how the data is being implemented and used because all the error that I've seen had to do with we build a beautiful data model and a beautiful database and then the theories were wrong because they made the wrong assumptions about the data and right. therefore but database got blamed or the data model got blamed but it was more of not understanding that um you know company and division are actually two separate things right so I've, the results i'm showing here um let me read, spread this out so the numbers it looks like the winner was no answer <laughs> and uh after that, the, the, the big roadblock was IT management support and not business support. So that one, it's, it's only 17% to 12%, so not a huge difference. There's only a vote difference of five different votes. Um, but I think those kind of things are reflected in the other options here. Tools, definitely, you don't think you're a problem, really. Skills and staffing. Um, and I think that, that pretty much... Um, is what I'm seeing out in the field as well, is that um, really the hardest time I have on the projects I work on is IT management not really buying into it. And I'm wondering if it's because we're not doing a good enough job expressing our value, which makes our jobs harder because we can't get the resources we need. Agree with that? Um, the resources, I, I think, in my our group, I think we do have adequate resources. Everybody could always mm -hmm. use more, but I think we have adequate resources. Yeah. What we don't Good. have are the the measures, the the backbone to stand behind us. They we make a reasonable amount of money for state employees, mm -hmm. <laughs> and don't say that out loud. <laughs> and we, we we do. I mean, for, for Florida, <laughs> we do, and yeah. they for all that they pay us, they don't listen. To us, <laughs> I think that's, that's actually that's about that today. Is that you know this is one of the reasons why consultants ex exist, so that employees can bring in consultants to say what they need to have said. <laughs> you know, it, I I think that's sort of a, a familiarity breeds contempt at times. But that, that is why a lot of people will talk about they don't feel like they have supportive management. And I wonder, it'd be interesting to do a survey of IT managers to see how they felt about that too. I wonder if it's just a perspective thing or not. Oh, of course, whiny babies. Exactly. Um, so, Tom, do you think the difference here? If I had asked this to primarily DBAs, what do you think they do? You think the answers would have been similar? Specific question. Yeah. So, when it comes to was it when it comes to the modeling? Oh. oh. Yeah. Just quit on me, but oh. okay. So the question was, uh, what's the biggest roadblock? So if you ask us the days, um, you probably have 100% no answer. Maybe 99% because <laughs> most of them wouldn't, wouldn't have any concept. <laughs> well, maybe we have to reword this and say, what's the biggest challenge for database administration? Um, sure. Because I think they go hand in hand. Because here's the thing is that we work with what is essentially a black box. It's just magic, right? And so a lot of people on the business side, whether an email, a Word document, or a data warehouse that's colored blue, it's all magic. It's done for you, and you need it by Friday, right? right? So it's really hard. To, it's really hard for people to understand the value of that. Like, uh, it's rare for me to, in my field to come across somebody who says, I know what the value is of a really good DBA. Usually, the idea is that I can just put ads out. I can get anybody to be the DBA. And I know that's the case because I see people who are accidental DBAs, they fall into it. They're, they're going to push sometimes because it's just discounted. Yeah. It's like, yeah, whatever. We kind of need that. But the people who get the value, they see the value, they're the ones, you know, well, they get it. They, they, yeah. know what it takes, they know the skills, but those people are just so few and far between these days. Yeah. So maybe the biggest roadblock, to me, I put down as skills. Of course, some manager in charge of the team, 
doesn't know whether DBA or Data Modeler does. They know what server guy does. So he's yep. that guy. He's the guy who knows what a switch is and yep. what the person that can model the data or do the correct HA implementation and, and the call architecture for the data as well. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I it's, think it's because of what he knows. Yeah, there's all How about the guy who knows where the data is? Because the guy flipping the switch doesn't know where that data lives. Nor mm -hmm. does he care. Correct. No, he doesn't or is he care. paid to care? So we've actually come to the top of the hour already, um, but we're going to stay on for a few more minutes after we turn the recording off, and then you can hear what we really think. I wanted to thank all of you, Pat. Well, audience, you have some great questions in the chat. Good discussion. I tried to answer a lot of the Q&A. We might get to some of those next. Jolene, as a first-time panelist, you were wonderful. Um, Tom, as a returning one, you were good enough. Well, actually, okay, great job. Um, Joe, what's next for you? Not just like what you're doing right after this, but what's going on in your life or your projects next? We um. In our team, we we found convinced management that we did in fact need an enterprise data architect, and we recently one of our team, one of the DA team, was recently hired as an enterprise data architect. And she and I are, she and I are working. She's working really hard at the presentation for um, master data management and data governance initiatives, Excellent. which we which we do on the fly. But <laughs> But but we can only do so much. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Excellent. So, Tom, what are coming hard. up next? Yeah, Speaking instruments or something like that? Uh, just because I, I have to take a shower still today. But, yeah, uh, I said not just right after this. <laughs> oh, I thought you said, what are you doing right after this? Oh, <laughs> mistake. Um, yeah, uh, yes, I do have an event coming up Saturday. Saturday, Connecticut, in North Haven. So if anybody's in the Northeast and you want to come meet me and, and talk to me and remind me of how much Karen is usually wrong in these things, that would be great. <laughs> After that, uh, two, so two weeks now, I go head out to Sally. So I'll be in Sequel Era, I think, or San Jose, one of those, for another Sequel Saturday event. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so I have a few SQL Saturdays coming up. Plus, I want to remind everyone that the Enterprise Data World Conference is coming up at the end of April. It's going to be in a great location. I'm doing a workshop and some other things there, plus going to do some live from the show floor type things that Anna and I are working on. And you can go to, ed to dataversity.net to find out more about Enterprise Data World. It's my favorite conference of all time. I've been going for more than 15 years. So, Shannon, I want to hand this back over to you. We're late, but I think that's okay. It's been great. I, I just love it. What, what you guys have been, Tom and Julie, how you guys have been just great today. I, it's been a very energetic conversation. And, of course, thanks to all the attendees who, who hang in there and just are so engaged with this uh, panel. We just love it. So uh, I will stop the recording for you, Karen, and thanks for the shout-out to EDW. Hope everyone will see you in Austin, Texas, here at the end of April. Um, stop recording.